Abby Ariane Williams, uh, we all know her, a pediatric intensivist from uh, Leiden Medical uh, Center, um, long lasting experience in pediatric cardiac intensive care and ECMO. And I think that uh, she will give us a great talk on a topic that we all are very, very interested on. Thank you for this kind introduction. Uh, I thank the scientific committee of the ELSO, but also my colleague Pete Rulevelt, who invited me to present uh, this interesting talk. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I will start this presentation with some slides on DIC on ECMO and then move to bleeding as bleeding represents one of the major consequences of DIC on ECMO and that some parts of the management of bleeding and DIC are similar. Patients requiring ECMO VA are at increased risk of developing a significant coagulopathy. Indeed, exposure of blood to the artificial surface of the ECMO circuit results in the activation of both the coagulation and the hyperfibrinolysis system, in addition to the activation of in the inflammatory system. Activation of the coagulation system may cause thrombus formation, but also consumption of coagulation factors and platelets, leading to bleeding. Activation of the hyperfibrinolysis system, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, further increases the risk of bleeding. To note is the contribution of the liver in the DIC process. Liver dysfunction may develop due to the underlying cause of DIC, such as sepsis, trauma, major surgery, but also ECMO, because it leads to release of tissue factor and activation of the extrinsic coagulation pathway, or secondary due to microvascular ischemia within the liver. Liver dysfunction leads to further consumption of platelets and clotting factors, impaired production of vitamin K dependent coagulation factors, further activation of the platelet coagulation fibrinolytic system, and finally hypersplenism and sequestration of clotting factor in acetic fluid. The diagnosis of DIC is based on clinical and laboratory parameters. Typical in DIC is the presence of bleeding or thrombosis of both at unusual sites or at different sites at the same time. The laboratory, laboratory tests commonly used are platelet count, coagulation screen, fibrinogen, and didymer or fibrin degradation products. PT, APTT, platelet count, and fibrinogen uh, provide important information on the proagulant uh, system, whereas didymer and FDP measures fibrin formation and fibrinolysis. However, there are some issues with the laboratory diagnosis of DIC in children that we should keep, that we should keep in mind. First, standardization of reference ranges is difficult in children. And second, low levels of normal physiological coagulation factors in neonates and small children may be misinterpreted as abnormal results. The RSTH criteria recommend a five-step diagnostic algorithm to calculate the IC score by using four laboratory tests. And the score equal or above five is compatible with overt DIC. This score is well validated in adults with a high sensitivity and specificity and demonstrate a strong correlation with mortality Unfortunately, although the score is universally used in children, data on validation in children is limited. Management of this in children on ECMO consists of several points. First, as DIC is triggered by an underlying cause, it is important to determine what, if, uh, sorry, it is the important to determine the cause, but also to exclude other diagnoses than DIC. Second, management of DIC needs regular clinical and laboratory surveillance. 
Third, in case of bleeding, the administration of blood products is mandatory, while in cases of thrombosis, adaptation of anticoagulation to higher doses should be considered. Fourth, ECMO circuit change can be necessary, certainly in cases of hyperfibrinolysis or over DIC, with consumption of coagulation factors and platelets. And finally, a multidisciplinary approach with consultation of experts is important in this severe and complex disorder. I will now move on to bleeding. It's a wide topic, and in, it, in the interest of time, I will only concentrate on some specific points. Data from the ELSA registry show that bleeding is frequent on ECMO VA and more frequent in cardiac ECMO compared to the other indications for ECMO. Furthermore, bleeding is associated with morbidity and mortality. Currently, there is no validated bleeding scale for critically ill children on ECMO, and it is unknown when bleeding should be considered clinically significant. In this recent study based on the CAPCORN database and including data from eight, mil eight centers, children supported by ECMO and who had chest tubes in place, blood loss above 60 milliliter per kilogram per day was independently associated with worse clinical outcome and increased mortality. As mentioned earlier, cardiac ECMO is a risk factor for bleeding. Other risk factors for bleeding are the presence of bleeding before ECMO, the presence of multiple organ dysfunction, surgery before ECMO, ECMO VA, and central cannulation. Two recent studies looked at the hemostatic parameters that may be associated with increased risk of bleeding on ECMO. In the first study, who is monocentric, bleeding patients presented lower platelets and longer prothrombin times. In the second multicenter study, based on the CAPCORN database, only a fibrinogen level above, uh, below, sorry, um, 120 milligrams per deciliter was associated with increased blood loss. As seen is in critically ill children, not on ECMO, there is no clear association between coagulation parameters, platelets, and fibrinogen, and the risk of bleeding unless those values are very abnormal. It is therefore difficult to predict bleeding using only hemostatic parameters. Management of bleeding in children on ECMO comprises two steps that I will discuss in the follow slides, following slides. The first one is the prevention of bleeding. The second one, the assessment of the severity and the cause of bleeding, and finally, the treatment of bleeding itself. The best manner to manage bleeding and its disastrous effect on morbidity and mortality is to prevent its occurrence. The first each issue I would like to discuss is cannulation. As presented earlier, central cannulation is a risk factor for bleeding. This is confirmed in the study presented on this slide. It's an adult study where you see that central cannulation compared to peripheral cannulation significantly increases the odds of bleeding, the need for surgical resternotomy, exposure to massive transfusion of red cells, and mortality. We all know that central cannulation has some advantages, such as the possibility to use larger cannulas and therefore run higher ECMO flows, and the ease of the approach in children after cardiotomy. However, the, advantage, the advantages of central cannulation should always be, always be balanced among the risk of bleeding in each patient. Some studies show also that percutaneous cannulation could be better than surgical cut down. And finally, in neonates, two older studies showed the benefit of using fibrin sealant or glue at the cannulation site to reduce cannula site bleeding, who is a frequent complication in children on ECMO. 
Second, to prevent bleeding on ECMO, it is important to avoid unnecessary procedures that contribute to bleeding. And if those are needed, that the approach with the lowest risk of bleeding is chosen. However, it is important not to postpone diagnostic or interventional procedures that may impact diagnosis, treatment, and or prognosis. In the presented study, cardiac catheterization on ECMO was feasible without severe bleeding and complications. Furthermore, cardiac catheterizations helped in the diagnosis, but also in the treatment of some residual lesions and allowed successful weaning in some patients. The second cornerstone of management of bleeding in cardiac ECMO is the assessment of bleeding. It is important to diagnose the pattern of the bleeding and to make a difference because be between a localized versus a generalized bleeding, as this can have implication for the treatment. One of the reasons why children are bleeding on ECMO is because they are anticoagulated. It is therefore mandatory to evaluate the degree of anticoagulation. In this context, it is probably indicated to use a combination of tests. Finally, one should also determine if there is an underlying coagulopathy explaining the excessive loss of blood. Although there are some limits to standard coagulation tests, platelet and fibrinogen to describe a coagulopathy, those are recommended in each patient that is bleeding. Some preliminary data in neonates and children on VA ECMO show that viscoelastic point of care tests not only can help in the diagnosis of a coagulopathy and to guide the administration of blood products, but also in the evaluation of anticoagulation. Their use could decrease the incidence of bleeding and the utilization of blood products. However, these, those conclusions are based on small studies and should also be confirmed in larger patient populations. The last cornerstone of the, of the management of bleeding on ECMO is the managing, management of the bleeding itself. First, it is mandatory to seek for early surgical consult, definitely in bleeding surrounding an invasive procedure. I personally cannot always convince the surgeon I my own hospital, but it is important, important to keep in mind that you cannot treat a surgical bleeding with blood products. The other different points presented on this slide will be addressed in the final minutes of my talk. Like in adults, there exists some evidence in children that implementation of an institutional protocol for managing patient at increased risk of bleeding or with bleeding is associated with decreased incidence of bleeding, but also thrombosis. The majority of the stud studies in children address the implementation of such protocol in post-cardiotomy patient, and those conclusions should therefore be confirmed in other patient populations. In some population of children on ECMO, such as neonates, with congenital diaphragmatic hernia and children on ECMO after open heart surgery, several observational studies suggest that decreasing targets for anticoagulation or even ceasing anticoagulation temporarily is associated with decreased blood loss and exposure to blood products without increasing the risk of circuit or patient thrombosis. In post-CPB, protamine reversal at separation of CPB can be considered. In the table presented on this slide, you can see different studies in different populations and the targets used in bleeding patients. Antifibrinolytics and hemostatic agents can also be considered. Currently, there is no evidence for or against the use of systemic antifibrinolytics in, children, in bleeding children on ECMO. However, several studies confirm the high risk of severe thrombotic complications and mortality associated with the use of recombinant factor 7A. Its use should therefore only be considered in life treatment and refractory bleeding. 
Finally, targeting higher threshold for platelets and fibrinogen should be considered in children bleeding. However, there is currently no hard evidence which threshold should be targeted. Low quality studies suggest maintaining platelets above 75 to 100,000 and fibrinogen above 100 to 150 milligrams per deciliter. As mentioned by Mela Bembea yesterday in her talk, those topics should be priorities for research in the next few years. In summary, the management of bleeding is based on the prevention of bleeding, the assessment and evaluation of anticoagulation and possible underlying coagulopathy, and finally the treatment of the bleeding itself that should be based on an institutional protocol, including consideration for decreasing or ceasing temporary anticoagulation, the use of antifibrinolytics and hemostatic agents, and targeting higher transfusion threshold after surgical control of the breeding. In a few months, the Pediatric ECMO Anticoagulation uh, Collaborative will publish guidelines based on expert consensus for the management of anticoagulation, the use of antifibrinolytics and hemostatic agents and the transfusion of blood products in children on ECMO. Those will not answer all our questions but open the way to research priorities in this topic. I thank you for your attention. Well, Ariane, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your talk. I think that we, we will have time uh, during the Q&A to discuss all these questions that we all have about a anticoagulation. Um, we will move to the, the next lecture. Um, it is a, a pleasure to introduce